So we will try to respect your time as much as we can. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Don Sauce here. I'm the Associate Director of the Teaching and Learning Center, and you have arrived at our professional development series. So however you got here, we're, we're excited for you here, and we're here every Wednesday at noon. Um, today's topic is going to be Jason Maysberg Tomlinson talking to us about accommodating students with disability and providing access for all. Um, before we get to Jason, I want to give you a couple of announcements that if you're interested in earning a certificate as part of our professional development series, we have that information. And Ashley or Noah will drop that link into the chat. If you're looking to become a TLC fellow, we also have information for how you can do that. And they'll again drop that information in the chat. And next week, if you're going to have fun today and you want to have more fun next week, um, Kathy Brockway will be presenting on creative and innovative thinking. And I'll remind you of these announcements at the end of this session as well. But before those announcements come later, we have an amazing session for you today. Jason Misburn Tomlinson is a superhero on our campus and he advocates and does wonderful, wonderful things. And what he's gonna to do today is help us also advocate for our students and to help them learn successfully. So Jason, I'm so excited to have you here today and the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Don. I appreciate that introduction. And I will say I'm a superstar because y'all are superstars. It's a team effort and advocacy and accessibility on this campus is made easier when everybody's on board thinking through and problem solving and helping us. And I got to say, I've worked at a couple different campuses and this is by far the best. And that's why I love what I do. My name is Jason Maysburg Tomlinson and I'm the director of the Student Access Center. And I will start sharing my screen here so y'all can see it. And so we're going to cover, oh, let me make sure I get that right. There we are. Um, you know, just a couple different aspects today. And I say a couple because, you know, the really the possibilities are endless. Um, when you think about accessibility, it's a pretty broad uh, topic. And it can be because we're thinking about accommodating people with disabilities. And the whole idea of disability can be quite broad. We oftentimes think of maybe specific disabilities we've encountered in our lives. Um, for some individuals that might be thinking about people who use a wheelchair, people who use a white cane and are blind, people who are deaf or hard of hearing, things that kind of come to mind as that visual. But I, I ask that we also broaden and many of us have experience with mental health and with other disabilities beyond that. And so we wanna kind of expand and I, I'd like to kind of just kind of introduce the thought that Disability for us in our office, it's not just about the diagnosis, although that gives us a lot of context for an individual's needs. It's about if there's a substantial limitation to a major life event is how the Americans with Disabilities Act puts it. And so we're looking at, you know, a person can have a diagnosis that we may commonly think of as a disability, but does it rise to that level? Or in the inverse of that, it may be a diagnosis, it may be a condition that we don't typically think of as a disability, but it does substantially impact an individual. And certainly one of those areas uh, that we'll talk briefly about is COVID-19. And the follow-up of COVID-19, I've worked and spoken with many people who have COVID, they return to classes, things go really well. We've worked with other individuals who a year after they had started testing negative for COVID-19, they still had the lingering effects and impacts of COVID. So there are many conditions like that. Well, let me kind of go through here. And I wanna talk a little bit about, you know, a little bit more about who we are. Uh, we're the Student Access Center, we're in Fulton Hall 202. We're also in the basement here. And as many of you probably already know, uh, we have a testing center in our basement. Upstairs, we have four access advisors. These are individuals who work directly with students to set up eligible accommodations. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. We also have two graduate assistants who work in our office. And so the access advisors are myself, Ann Pierce, Natalie Bahari, and Lindsay Kabina. And we work directly with the students. And then we have Jenny and Melissa, who are graduate assistants who go through our, you know, our email, answering emails for the office, answering the phones, being there at the door to greet people who come in and also help a little bit in our test center. In our test center, uh, is Ann Collett, and our test center is there so that students who need accommodations for exams in particular, let's say extended time, distraction reduced environment, so that faculty really, it's for faculty a tool there, have a place to make sure students are accommodated when resources may not be available in a department, another classroom, and so on. Um, 
And so it's there to assist faculty to make sure the testing accommodations can be put together. Just so you all know, the test center is there from eight to five, um, and we have staff who can help schedule. And again, we'll talk a little bit more. One of the big changes that I want to make sure uh, to talk about, and I, it's been out in K-State Today at Edition since early 2020, but as we've navigated back to campus, remind folks that we no longer have the golf cart shuttle. Um, we used to have the golf cart to help students with temporary injuries and students with uh, permanent disabilities and uh, physical disabilities get to class. Budget cuts and, and needs there just can't keep up with that and, and, and budget wise. And so we've had to discontinue that. Um, and so on the flip side of that, what's changed a lot since we started that program 20 plus years ago is that we also now have the park and ride shuttle that goes kind of around campus in two different ways. Uh, we have, and that's free for students. We've also worked with Adabus and they have a demand response system that's basically point to point where a student can set up rides from their home to campus location. Um, and if they ha have a disability, if they're a K-State student, they ride that for free, which is pretty cool. And so we still work with students to make sure that, especially a student has a temporary injury and they're trying to get to class, they have 10 minutes. We work with faculty to know, hey, the student might arrive late. Let's give them a note taker. Let's make sure they have access to the information as well. But that's just an update I'd like to touch upon. Today, I'm gonna to go through a couple key pieces, uh, talk a little bit about how our office operates uh, and share with you all that process. I'm gonna talk a little bit about our accommodation system, AIM, uh, that we do uh, letters of accommodation through. Talk a little bit more about the test center. I wanna talk a little bit about what we learned during COVID-19. Uh, it's been an interesting process in our field uh, and on college campuses in general, as we know. And then I wanna talk a little bit about digital accessibility because that was directly tied to COVID-19 in regards to so many classes going online. And that's been an, an interesting topic. And, and I, I will be one to say that the reason COVID-19 is gonna be important for us as we go to the future is that a lot of the changes, a lot of things we learned during COVID-19 are gonna be used in the future. Uh, we've noticed more faculty using online tools, more use of PDF files, Word documents online. I don't think the, the, the repercussions of COVID-19 and what we've learned about education and flexibility, I think will continue on and we'll continue to think about that. So in regards to what to expect, I always want to make sure faculty and staff know that they can email, set up Zoom meetings, Microsoft Teams. I have folks contact me that way uh, through the phone or just office visits. And we really are here to work with faculty and students. Uh, we're here primarily to serve students and set up accommodations, but we couldn't do that if we didn't work with you all uh, to make sure that could happen and make sure we have good communication. Just a brief rundown of what we do in our process with students. Uh, obviously we meet with students who have a disability and when working with them, we review documentation, we review information that qualifies them as a person with a disability. This is called our interactive process. And, and that's that process of interacting with the individual to set up accommodations. And through that, we do an assessment of, are they a person with a disability? Like I mentioned, it's not just about the diagnosis, it's also about documentation and help us get more information on what rises to that level of uh, substantial limitation that's gonna qualify them for accommodations. With, we, we work under the Americans with Disabilities Act as amended in 2008, and that's kind of our guiding resource there, but also the Rehabilitation Act. Um, and with housing, we do housing accommodations. We operate under the Fair Housing Act and we, we pay attention to that. And looking at those pieces, the documentation, I should put that in quotes, I guess, uh, because it's not just about strict documentation. If we're working with somebody who rolls into our office who uses a wheelchair or they're using a white cane, we're gonna know that person has a disability. If they use a white cane, chances are they're blind or have low vision. Uh, if they use a wheelchair, physical limitations. If a student comes in and is working with Natalie uh, and they're signing, we're gonna know they're deaf or hard of hearing. So we can use observational information in, in our process as well um, and know that you know we don't necessarily need strict documentation to know that somebody needs physical access. Through our process and interaction with the student, we're determined if they have, and they typically are gonna request accommodations and we're determined if those are reasonable. This is an important term uh, that I will admit it seems a little bit bureaucratic, but there's a reason for that. 
Reasonable accommodations are kind of two way. One is an accommodation that's warranted by the documentation, by the disability. And is, do we have the support to really say this is going to be an accommodation that's appropriate? I bring it up here to you all because I think it's important to, for you all to know that another phase of this is, is it also a reasonable accommodation for the environment in which we operate? So, for example, if a student's asking to have an open book test for every test, it's probably not going to be reasonable um, and it's probably not appropriate because it's going to change the assessment process. Or um, if it's an accommodation that might fundamentally alter a course, again, we think a lot about learning outcomes in this process, and we oftentimes reach out to faculty to learn a little bit more, then we're not going to be able to approve an accommodation, especially, you know, this sometimes is a per class basis, because we need to abide by uh, thinking about the learning outcomes, what's the, the purpose of the class, and also as kind of that core structure of our accreditation um, and abiding by that. Typically, though, in most requests are, are reasonable and, and warranted by documentation. And so then we set up eligibilities for accommodations in our system. Say eligibilities, because I think it's important for faculty to know that students might be eligible for, let's say, five accommodations, but they may be only using one or two in a class. Maybe they're using all five. Um, they really have a choice in the process I'm going to talk about with AIM to determine what accommodations they're using in your environment. The reason for that, I get asked all the time is, well, if a student needs testing accommodations, why aren't they requesting it? Or maybe it's a different kind of an accommodation. Maybe the student has an accommodation to take breaks to walk during the middle of a lecture. Well, if the student's signing up for a lab that they know they're going to be walking around, then they may not request that accommodation because it's a new point. They're going to be walking around. Um, and our classes can vary. And especially as students get to their third and fourth year, they're going to know that, hey, this is a class I need this accommodation in. No, this is a class I'm not going to need my accommodation in. And the student in this process, we're sharing with them that we're not going to share a diagnosis information specific to their disability with faculty, with others. And that's important for a number of reasons. But for the student, that's important because they don't always want to share their disability information with others. And if they don't need the accommodation, they may not request it because they don't want to necessarily share that part of their identity with others and, and request those. So each semester, students can go through and request their letters of accommodation, and they're now sent directly to faculty um, and, uh, and the student as well, so they have a copy of that. This is different. Earlier in a previous system, we would email these to students and they would share them with faculty. Now we have a bit more of a direct process here. The whole system is done through AIM, and this is our kind of uh, accommodation interface, if you will. And we have two portions of it. The one is the student AIM portal, where students go in, in, in and interact with their accommodations to set them up for classes. As you think about that piece, too, you may get a letter of accommodation at any point in the semester. We don't, we, we remind students to request their letters of accommodation, but they may remember to do that halfway through the semester um, and or later on they may register with us late. It's important to enact those accommodations at any point in the semester with the caveat of if a student's requesting testing accommodations the day before an exam, it's okay to say, hey, because of the timeliness and because of what I need to set up, I don't have enough time to put this into place. Oftentimes we can, but there may be some accommodations that require a little bit more interaction with our office. And we, want, we let students know they need to request their letters early enough to get those in place in a timely manner. But students could register with us at any time. They may request their letters at any time. Um, we oftentimes have a lot of first year students who want to start the semester without accommodations. They may have an experience in high school, middle school that negatively impact them because of their disability identity. And so they want to kind of step away from that in college. Uh, but then they find out, you know, I do need these accommodations. I do need to work with something. And so then they start working with us. What's cool about AIM, and one of the things we like is on the screen, I'm showing you our homepage with it, which is ksu.edu slash access center. You'll notice here we have a button on the left side of the page for students to register with our office, the student AIM portal for students to log in, request their letters. Um, and do a few other actions we'll talk about in a little bit. But there's also a faculty AIM portal. And this is really cool. 
and that faculty can go in and see who's in their class, who's requested accommodations for their class, and more on that in a second. First, I'll show you a little bit students, like I said, they can request letters per class, and they can actually select which classes they want to use their accommodations in. It's a very, you know, self-directed by the student um, and through the process. And this is different from high schools. High schools oftentimes have somebody there saying, you're gonna use these accommodations. We're gonna send them to your faculty. We're directing things for you. Here, the student's in charge. And so as they go in, they can select letters that way. For faculty, you can actually log in and find out which students have requested letters in your class. Now, two things here, one, Sometimes faculty may need to log in a second time that first time they go to log in. For some reason, one and I don't know how many, a uh, faculty member will log in, the, the system won't recognize them, but yet if they try logging in again, they're good to go. And it's with the K-State EID and single sign-on. Um, other times faculty log in and everything's ready to go. Uh, we've tried to problem solve this. We're not sure why that happens. It's happening less these days, but still once in a while. The other thing to note is that this is for students who have requested letters of accommodation. I think of this as a backup for when uh, if the letters are emailed to faculty, but if faculty um, can't find that email or they're trying to remember all the students in their class who have an accommodation and unable to pull that up, they can log in and see who's requested what accommodations in their class and see those individually. Um, and it'll actually tell you under which category. So if you have exam accommodations, note-taking accommodation, uh, text-based accommodation, or communication. Um, and sometimes that'll change based on uh, our system, but this has been a nice way for faculty to go in and, and find that information. The other kind of piece that AIM is a good tool for is our test center. I know many of you have used our test center in the past for students using accommodations. Before it was very faculty centric in that faculty would log into cases and input a lot of information. With AIM that's changed a little bit. Um, I should mention this is kind of on par with what a lot of our colleagues are doing across the country, uh, but it is a shift for us. That um, students actually now, well, you'll get an alert if you have a student in your class using testing accommodations. You'll notice on the letter of accommodation that you have to do a test agreement. This helps us collect information for each class on what a student's going to need for their exams and to get that from faculty, you know, if they're allowed notes, uh, what the time parameters are, some pieces like that. We certainly encourage student, uh, faculty, if they want to tell us the time of their exams and, and more details, we welcome that information. There's a space for that in the uh, faculty agreement. But really, ideally, we want students to log in and schedule their exams with our test center to tell us what time. Um, and, and give us that information. It helps us keep organized. It helps us communicate between the faculty and students. There are a lot of reminders that go out from the system to remind the student to come to our test center and to take the exam. Uh, we do have students who forget where they're supposed to go. Um, it also, you know, if we're, we need a test, it's a way to remind faculty that, hey, we still need a copy of your exam to Proctor. Um, and it gets all the parameters for each exam and keeps that all organized. It's also a great way to keep kind of a secure location to upload exam files and other materials. We take test security very seriously in our test center. And we, we proctor by camera. We keep it quiet. We're keeping the accommodations in place, but it's separate from how we have a testing office in room two in Holden Hall. And then room one is a 19 Carroll test center. Students can't take anything with them unless it's de uh, determined appropriate by the faculty member. It includes phones, we look for smartwatches, we look for those pieces. The only time a student's gonna be able to carry their phone in them as technology evolves is if they have to use it to monitor their health. We do have a number of students with type one diabetes, for example, whose phone actually monitors in real time their health and tells them if their sugars are low, if they need to take something. And it's important for them to track it at all times. Otherwise, students aren't allowed to take anything with them. And so we monitor that quite closely. Uh, and, and our test center coordinator keeps track of all that. <clears throat> this system allows us to be more efficient and also, again, keep that communication uh, going back and forth between us and the student and the faculty. We have 1,800 and more exams a semester. 
uh, fall semester, spring semester. That's quite a few. Most of those come during midterms and finals. So it's a lot of information going back and forth and it's important for us to have that accurate. When, I forgot to mention, you know, when, when we do have something that's unauthorized behavior, uh, a student finds a way to sneak notes in, um, and we catch that and we report it to faculty. And then faculty can contact honor and integrity and we give them the information to kind of report that situation. It happens very rarely. Um, and students have tried to be very sneaky. Um, and so, uh, again, we don't allow, let's say, hats or brims. Um, we check what they're taking in with them for pens and pencils even. Um, but students have found ways, but we've also watched them. Uh, because in that center, we have, gosh, 10 plus cameras uh, watching them. And so we, we zoom in. Uh, we're also working with uh, kind of constantly evaluating tools uh, with exams, you know, read and write, new hardware, ventilation, do we make improvements uh, over the last couple of years? I mentioned this because if you worked with us last year, we had to use the Career Center for a testing location for on-campus exams because we didn't have the appropriate ventilation in our uh, test center. Uh, they actually came in. I and others have worked here for 20 plus years. We didn't know we had an air circulation system for the elevator in our building. Otherwise, we don't have inside outside airflow. They came in and installed ventilation into our testing room so we could return there in the spring um, and update that so we could serve students. And that was incredibly helpful. And we make upgrades. You mentioned COVID-19. Uh, I, I, I think it's going to constantly evolve. And those of you I've worked with in the past year know that we're just kind of keeping up on changes and updates in how we can work with students and what needs they have. There have been a couple of accommodation changes with our office and we work with a couple of you to set these up. And I do want to preface this by saying these aren't common accommodations because we recognize the importance of in-person attendance. We're now back to in-person as a primary mode of education here on campus. Um, but COVID-19 has had us explore a couple different accommodations. One is remote attendance. Um, in certain situations, the documentation is warranted the student to be remote, um, maybe because uh, we have situations where documented that students' vaccines actually aren't helpful. The student can't get vaccinated because of a condition they have, not an immune system, um, or other factors come up. And, and so what we do is we look to see if that student can attend online classes, look for other course options. And if needed, we look for remote attendance as an accommodation. And what's good about this process though, is students are already thinking about online learning. They're looking at that um, now. And so oftentimes we'll be looking at courses that some of them have been easy to make remote. Others, a lot of lab classes, weren't able to make those remote. We understand that, but we do explore that when we can. Many people have asked, you know, the face coverings policy, the mask mandate, and, and the literature that's gone out in regards to wearing masks on campus does state students can have an accommodation for a face shield. This is extremely rare. Uh, these are situations when a request is made, we need some pretty specific documentation. And I'll be honest with y'all, I've only seen a couple examples where it's warranted an accommodation. And before we uh, have a student in a situation where they don't have a mask, we're looking at remote attendance. And when that's possible, we're working with faculty to make sure they can attend remotely. We're thinking about the impact of COVID-19 on themselves and others in their environment. So that doesn't come up very often, but I do get questions. If you have a question, let me know. I'm happy to talk. Let's talk about some things we've learned. <laughs> we've learned a lot, more than you'd fit on any, any presentation, but there's some kind of key pieces that have helped us be successful uh, as we continue to evolve with COVID-19 and accommodations. The, there's no playbook for COVID-19. We haven't operated in a pandemic before, and it's kind of really pushed us on in looking at accommodations and disability in a different way. We've learned, you know, be understanding um, as we work with students. Uh, we lead with grace, open communication, learning more information. I myself have worked with students and thinking about, let's say that remote attendance, for example, learned about new diagnoses or diagnoses we thought we knew a lot about, but it turned out there were a lot of implications for COVID-19 in regards to immune systems and being compromised um, and other issues that had come up. 
uh, and the same with learning about mental health and impacts COVID-19 has had. And so we've just kind of been walking through that. And we, if we can, we don't make a decision overnight. We're trying to make sure we learn as much as possible before we enact accommodations, um, knowing that we need to get information and make a wise decision rather than a quick one sometimes. We also have learned, you know, disability is one dimension of a student, of an individual we're working with. We all have other identities. Well, there are other communities we're working with, we're part of, and our students are not only that, but they're also parents, caretakers, and processing change going on around us. And so working with students and open communication to talk with them and their needs and understanding that full context. Um, and this is coming to play with COVID-19. And it's not just our office, we're working with other offices to make sure the student has assistance and the things that they need um, and throughout. And so one piece I think to know is we work quite closely with the Office of Student Life there across the hall. We work a lot with academic coaching, tutoring, um, other services because uh, our office may be an entry point for a student to talk about accommodations, but we need to think about what are those services that are going to help them be successful. And this may be their first touch point with one of our offices, and we can help them make sure they understand all of the broad services here that are available to them. Um, and, and oftentimes, again, it's good to talk. Faculty have questions as they're working with a student, we're here to chat. Um, it's making sure that communication is going through and making sure we understand everything. Another thing is we're learning more and more that students are using multiple technologies and it's important to be aware of that. This is a picture of my son's desk because he started online learning, gosh, 18 months ago. Um, and these courses in sixth grade required him to be on a laptop and in class, but also they had a um, Apple iPad that they used for class and all these pieces. And all of a sudden they're learning to coordinate these technologies with their learning environment. Big shift. It's also been a big shift for our students. Our students are using online technologies more. And it's important to think about that student using, let's say Canvas. Well, now they're also navigating Canvas sometimes in real time in a class that's a synchronous environment. And they're also using technology like Read and Write to turn text into speech because they're not just reading visually from the screen, they're also listening to that information using read and write. <clears throat> they're also, and we think about this a lot for exams, tracking information from screen to paper and back again and holding on to that information. I've worked with online learning environments for 20 years now. And in setting up accommodations for online learning, we learned early on that tracking information is different for students using a test on the screen than it is on paper. We oftentimes will be looking at a piece of paper and scanning up and down and kind of coordinating information, circling, underlining. You can't do that with online technology in the same way. So we've worked with students who are maybe writing things down to work with that information. And so this has been quite a change for students as they navigate with their technology um, and learning those pieces. We've also, as we work with students, I think we've all noticed this. Students have ways they learn in environments. They've grown up in the system for 12 plus years uh, in education and classrooms, and they've had coping skills for that in regards to, okay, I need to take notes, and I always take notes on paper, um, or record my lecture, or you know, I capture information in the physical classroom. Now that's been disrupted because now we have a lot more online tools. Um, and even again, as we've moved on through the pandemic, even though we've returned to in-person structure, we have faculty using Canvas more. Um, and so students are coordinating that information as well in regards to you know, tracking the information, learning the information, and then output um, through their assignments. And less of an issue now, but definitely through last year, we also were working with situations where students didn't have the same internet speed. They're working with these technologies and ran into um, issues here and there when there were disruptions just to their internet speed and keeping up. It's getting a little bit better for a lot of students. And now, again, students who are choosing to learn remote and online classes, um, I think I've had to think about that and what it means for them. We still work with a couple of faculty who are using Zoom and still doing either hybrid learning or maybe some online uh, classrooms in synchronous fashion. 
When working with students with disabilities, I think it's important to keep a couple things in mind as well. Um, and, and I think we've all heard and discussed Zoom fatigue. We feel like we're on all the time and we're in meetings. And I think a student was telling me about this and I'm like, wow, I really identify with that. They said, I used to go to class, sit in the back, and I was cool. I didn't have to be seen all the time. I could speak when I raised my hand, but I had control on when I was being seen and interacting with others. But Zoom, they felt like they were always on, their pictures always on the screen. And that was different. And so we've been working with some students and in a couple of situations, some faculty to say, hey, you know, this person um, for various reasons needs to turn off their camera. Um, they need to be able to focus on the class and it's hard for them to focus when you know, that being on all the time and the student with, let's say, anxiety, that's disrupting their learning and they're not focusing on the tasks at hand. Um, and, and they're processing information in new ways and it's been disrupted by Zoom, um, but learning to manage it. But we have a lot of students who are very happy to get back to the physical classroom because again, they're back to that environment they know and factors they feel like they control a little bit more. It's also been visually and auditorially distracting uh, for students. Um, a simple example is you know, working with a student with ADHD who that visual element of people moving around, cats walking across the screen or anticipating that this student has a cat and it's gonna walk across the screen, holds some bandwidth and it's hard to focus on class. And the auditorially piece, I was working with a faculty member last year and they weren't aware of just how loud background information was. Um, <clears throat> students had their microphones on and as they were discussing, but they hadn't paid attention until a student brought it up that, well, this person has an air conditioner unit that's all a constant hum. And it was hard to separate that information out from the information they needed to pay attention to with the lecture or class discussion. And so the auditory information coming at us can be more and distracting. We've also worked with situations, uh, we have a lot of students who utilize note takers or getting PowerPoints in advance or other maybe recording lectures. And that's changed a little bit as we moved on to Zoom and students are recording that differently or finding new ways to take notes um, in that as well. We've also been discussing, um, thinking about what we've learned, uh, communication and making sure that faculty, and this is the same for us staff, that we're sending information that's similar. And that if we're sending an email, if it's in the syllabus, that they're reflected equally. And that we don't have confusing information. Students are looking at that syllabus as kind of that gold standard. And when they got information over a lecture or over email that was slightly differently, they would conflict on which one should I follow. And we've had some students struggle with that a little bit. Um, I think because in some cases, classes have changed uh, on the fly. And appropriately so, as faculty have learned what student needs are, how to use technology differently, made shifts. And they, we need to remember to kind of go back and say, okay, you know, I had this policy in place or here's how we did this task. And now it's changed and making sure it's reflected and updated their syllabus and being kind of clear and concise. Also with Canvas, if you use Canvas, and we have a lot of faculty who are using Canvas more as a resource in addition to their physical classroom, make sure you go over how to find items. Uh, quizzes, um, use, uh, we have assignments, but they're called quizzes in Canvas, making sure that nomenclature and that we're talking about those items, that's gonna be reflected in Canvas, but where to find it. We all, and I'm guilty of this too, I teach an online class. We, we structure the course, uh, how it meets our needs, the content needs, but the way I use a module or content may be different from the way another faculty member uses content. For a student going from class to class, it's hard to get used to understanding the organization of each course. And so I think just being clear and communicating, here's where you're gonna find lecture information. Here's where you're gonna find your assignments. And here's maybe I have like a document that ties it all together. And it's kind of our week by week schedule. And it says, here's where everything can be found and, and doing that. In addition to that, we've also used Canvas for exams more. Uh, this is just a reminder, we do have information on our website for extending times on Canvas. Um, mentioned quizzes, uh, we have assessments, and sometimes it's not maybe a full exam, but it's different assessments in Canvas. Um, you can extend the time on those. And 
topic that doesn't come up very often, but I do like to touch upon it, is extended time and when to give extended time. Um, typically we say if an assessment is due within a day, we need to make sure to give that student, let's say time and a half, if that's what's warranted. But we do talk differently about having a window open for a student needs to take this 30 minute assessment Monday through Friday, at any time it's up to them. So where do, where do we extend the assessment itself or that window? And when we're talking about accommodations, we wanna extend just the assessment itself. So let's say a student has time and a half, we take that 30 minute assessment, now it's 45 minutes, but they still have that same window of days to take that assessment. Um, and, and some faculty have said, well, I opened it up so that I, I really, the, this assessment only takes an hour, but I give students a five hour block on a given day to take that assessment. And I know this can be tricky, um, but technically the student with an accommodation still warrants time and a half on that five hour block. It seems like a lot of time, but other students have that time to look, let's say it's open to open book, they have that time to find information. And in that block of time to look and research, maybe you know, look up in a book or something. And that student with the accommodation, that time and a half is, let's say it's in regards to processing information um, and, and for that 30 minute test. Well, it's also gonna take them longer to look in a book and to look up the information. That processing time may affect that process too. So we add the extra time. More than ever, though, just reach out to us if you have any questions about that and what is the appropriate extra time for an assessment. We'd be happy to talk. One of the pieces uh, that has continued to be a discussion, and many of you we've worked with, uh, Deborah, you've done a, a lot of work on this with us, and we really appreciate it, is print accessibility. And this has evolved considerably over the last couple decades. And this is where a lot of students are impacted that we don't often think about, but PDFs, Word documents. I mentioned students who use Read and Write to turn text into audible information and getting that information basically kind of in a different way. This is where I think we're seeing a lot of impact on campus and where we're looking to empower faculty with some two new tools. And also our instructional designers will be talking next week about some of these tools. So I'm just gonna talk about each one of them because questions do come up. Uh, Word, uh, when we're creating a text document, we wanna use this most often. It's kind of universally accessible. It's easy to make accessible. It's easier to work with too. Anybody who's word worked with a PDF, it can be complicated to make that accessible. Whereas a Word document, kind of what you see is what you get. The text is right there in front of us and it's easier to work with. We've got a couple um, ideas here and I'd make best practices for Microsoft Word. Um, there's certainly a lot more out there uh, available online. There's a great website called webaim.org. They're incredible wealth of information um, and many resources with uh, digital accessibility. But with Word, you can actually use different styles within a Word document. Um, rather than just making something bold, you can actually use styles. So it kind of gives a uniformity to a Word document. It makes it much more accessible. We can also use lists sequential, non-sequential, and tables and implement that in Word quite nicely. Now I realize, oh, the, well, let's talk about PowerPoint. Then we'll talk about PDF, which is actually impacts more people. Um, PowerPoint, there are best practices for using PowerPoint. If you use PowerPoint quite often, I uh, recommend using the accessible templates um, and you can use some means to make that more accessible as well. Um, unfortunately, uh, Word is easier to make accessible because we typically write in the same box and, and the text is kind of flows. With PowerPoint, we can add these text boxes and make it look visually different. But oftentimes we do want to use a template um, that the different template options that PowerPoint gives us. So we're following some standards and so that PowerPoint knows how to make it accessible for a reader as well. It does have an accessibility checker that kind of helps with this. And there's some cool tools here. Um, PowerPoint is still fairly easy to work with. Uh, the one that impacts many people is PDFs. And I, I know I, I sound like a broken book, uh, record sometimes, uh, but uh, PDFs are everywhere and they can be stinkers to work with. <laughs> um, and when I talk about PDFs, it's not just, um, you know, we can print from PDF to PDF from like Microsoft Word, but it'll actually have some hidden text in it for a screener to use. In the last year, and I'm not kidding, 
when I say that we've worked with text files in PDF that range from a nice file that started as like a Word document or a website even to things that were scanned in where we visually couldn't read it. And it was quite difficult and tried to make that accessible. Um, and some things with wavy lines. With PDFs, um, a couple things to note, and I did an article, uh, K-State Today, the first week of classes on this. We do have some tools here on campus that help make PDFs more accessible. And if you use a lot, I'd recommend you check those out. One is if you do a simple search for Read and Write, um, you'll find that we use Read and Write on campus as an accessibility tool, but it's also a learning tool. And it happens to help us with PDF accessibility. And down here, um, oh, I need to go back. There we go. Um, if you go to our website, ksu.edu slash access center, you can navigate to for faculty and staff, click on online environments, and then click on documents. We put a page together that talks about using read and write to actually scan a PDF file and make it accessible. It can actually take that text and turn into usable text. And what I mean by that is if you pull up a PDF file, let's say it's one you got through interlibrary loan through, let's say, a, um, an online resource. You might be able to actually select text, use your cursor and select text on that document. It means it's searchable um, or more accessible too. And that means that something like Read and Write can actually take that text and turn it into audio. Um, we have other screen readers like JAWS and NVDA as well that work for people who are blind to turn that text into an audible format. But if you use like a funky machine behind me here, I've got a scanner here that I can just click a button and it makes a PDF. That is typically just taking a picture of the document. It is not finding the text within to make that accessible. So for those, you can use Read and Write, which we also use to turn that text into audible format, and actually scan it and add text to the document. Uh, we're lucky, Read and Write has a very powerful OCR engine, which is optical character recognition. It's just that, it recognizes the characters of words and puts those together. Um, we've also, so this kind of adds the text there, and for a lot of documents, it works really well. We're also gonna work with our instructional designers on campus and give them access to a new tool called Equidox. Um, if anybody's ever worked with Adobe PDF to edit the text um, and work to make it accessible, you deserve an award. It's, it's very complicated. We used to joke, and unfortunately it wasn't a joke. The book on accessible PDF, making accessible PDFs or accessibility, it's like a thousand pages long and very thorough. Adobe is very complicated. And for those that aren't aware, Adobe was a very closed system for many years. The PDF file format was only used by Adobe. You had to work with a certain way. It was all about security and whatnot. About 10 years ago or so, it was moved to be an international standard, an ISSO. Um, so PDF could be used by many different corporations and, and now it's made it better. But Adobe, P, Adobe the product, Adobe Professional, it's quite complicated. Um, well, Read and Write allows us to add text to it and scan that for text. But now we have a, this Equidox program where we'll work with, and, and faculty can contact me and get access to this as well. It takes some learning, but you can actually take and see a document and go through and edit the text to make sure it's accurate and make sure that text underneath is accurate um, for a display for a student who needs it to be accessible. So we're working on that to give that uh, access to our instructional designers and work on things. Now I will say, I wanna say the easiest way of all, and that helps us all use our ser existing uh, services on campus, is if you're using or posting an article, um, a research article, or something that can be found through our resources at the library, um, through our databases, and you can find that article that lives through um, JSTOR or ERIC, whatnot, and you can access it through Hale, why not just link to the original document? Most of those, all of them that I've worked with lately are fully accessible to begin with. And if we post a link to that document, then the accessibility is built in better than you can recreate it in one of these tools. And you don't have to think about these steps. So I recommend, you know, getting that, or if you're working with a, a publishing house, make sure you get an accessible document to begin with. If you're getting through interlibrary loan, request a searchable document 
and it'll be sent to you with accessibility built in, in most cases. Hopefully one day I, I foresee, I love the convenience of it. And if you know how to work with it, it works really well, but I hope to see an end to scanners with that PDF button to make a PDF because unfortunately it's just not accessible and it gets us in more trouble than it's worth sometimes. We've been talking a lot about video accessibility in the last couple of years. Uh, and we know a lot of faculty have created video content and uh, we've worked on a process for this as well. And video accessibility, oftentimes we're talking about captions and um, some cool new updates with Zoom that all faculty, a lot of faculty are starting to use in classrooms, regardless of disability, is automatic captions. You can turn on automatic transcripts and caption the content in real time with Zoom. And now for people, uh, if you're working with a student with a disability as an accommodation, they need captioning. We have different ways to do that as well. And, you, and if it's a student registered with our office needing it for accommodation, you can work with our staff, uh, Natalie specifically, uh, myself as well, uh, but to get more information on making that, those captions uh, present. If it's uh, real time, and we do have a lot of these situations, we actually work with a vendor out of Kansas City area, uh, we've been working with for quite some time, who can actually synchronously add captions to our content. Now you may ask, well, if I can do those automatically in Zoom, why do I need to go through and have a captioner or uh, somebody actually add captions to that? The reason for that is in a lot of our content in academia, our language isn't always captured by automatic transcription. And so in something like biochemistry, physics, engineering, we're using language that may not be picked up very well. So we have to have a professional in there to make sure we're more accurate for the student who needs to have the accuracy. It's very important. And it helps students who are deaf or hard of hearing participate in live sessions. Um, if we're recording it, if we um, have that content, we then can work with you. And I think Brandon Utech was here as well. And we thank him very much his help. He's been very helpful to also, we have a connection with a vendor through media site where we hope you're posting your videos because then we can connect them with that vendor to add captions to that file as well. In recent years, we've actually picked up to make sure that we can help pay for these services and get those taken care of through a central fund here at the university. Um, our primary need is to make sure students have this in a timely manner and have access to their course content ASAP so we can help them out. Um, there are a couple tips we like to share when creating videos uh, that make it easier for you and, and for our students in, in the captioning. Uh, one is if you can create a transcript before you start recording, it's best practice, you can do that. Then we already have that transcript to work with. And it also makes your video go more smoothly. I've talked with a lot of faculty who said, well, I didn't like making a transcript at first, but when I had one, my lecture went more smoothly and I didn't have to think about it. I just kind of went through my transcript. Helps also to keep information concise and to think about the content being shared. <clears throat> I've worked with captioning online courses for many years and oftentimes 20 years ago, 15, 10 years ago, we like to just capture a lecture and put it online for an online course. But what we were captioning was a lecture with the students there in a classroom. And when we started captioning it, we realized that, you know, of this 50 minute lecture, there's a lot of dialogue between the students and the faculty member that were based on the class. It was, you know, talking about the football game, talking about other things going on. Well, our distance students who might have been watching this a um, semester later, a year later, didn't need that content. So we're actually 40 minutes or less of that 50 minute class was actually important for the lecture. And this goes back my a long time ago. Uh, it would have been 2009, I wanna say. We on campus used to have the Axio conference, uh, which was for our previous learning management system. And speaking at that conference was the, at the time, the president of the Community College Association. And she was sharing research they had done on video. And what they found was that in a study of students, online students looking at 50 minute videos, Typically, students actually stopped watching it after 11 and a half to 12 minutes. They were finding the content elsewhere. It wasn't keeping their focus. 
And so what they started to do, she worked, uh, gosh, she was at, um, in Texas. Uh, Galveston is where she lived. I can't remember what university she worked with or what uh, community college. But they started to work with faculty to chunk that information. And faculty really liked that because instead of updating their lecture, their entire lecture, semester after semester, they just had to record a 10 minute video. And maybe for that lecture, they had three 10 minute videos. If they had to update something, they just had to update one video of 10, five minutes instead of the entire lecture. And it worked really well. Also helps us caption it and keep that content updated uh, with captions as well. So I realize I'm running out of time <laughs> and I've gone through quite a few different topics. Um, these are, you know, based on the questions that come up for us each year, but I'd also be happy to answer any questions from you all um, and cover uh, things. And I do see some questions have come through um, and I can touch on these. Um, so uh, Melissa, uh, first year students navigating the differences in college. Oh, that is a million dollar question. Um, because not every high school experience is the same. So it is case by case. We work with some students who are empowered or autonomous, asking great questions and are guiding that process really well. Other students who have had staff, their parents, others really navigate that process for them. We worked with students and we talked with them about how it's gonna be different. We do uh, make sure to send out reminders to students to request their letters of accommodation, for example, because they're not used to directing that process. Um, there are differences in accommodations that we talk with students about. And some students have had accommodations in high school that aren't gonna be um, appropriate, aren't gonna be reasonable in higher education. Um, we work with some students from high schools where every student has the chance to retake a test two or three times. That's not an accommodation we're gonna use. I've never used it in my career and I'm not gonna say it's never gonna happen. We never say that in our field, but that's not a typical accommodation. Um, but students are used to that. And so that can be a change coming to college. There are other accommodations that are used. There are different laws that guide K through 12 in college. And so we take that perspective into effect when we're working with accommodations that just aren't gonna be appropriate. Um, and so we work with quite closely. Uh, for some students, it's quite a shock. And for others, it goes a little bit better. I'm gonna end my share. So this might be a little bit easier here. Um, and then duo. Oh. Yeah, duo. So when students start to need that, um, they're going to need to print off a list, but we can have them take their phone into um, just to get that code and type it in as needed. That hasn't come up. Uh, they're not using duo as students yet. We've had a couple situations where we have staff taking classes and something came up, but um, we have spoken a little bit with um, IT and when that does come up, we're gonna have to think about some options there, such as maybe fencing off that area so we don't have to use Duo to sign in because it's gonna be difficult to manage. If you have 30 students taking a test one day going back and forth, Duo can be hard to track. And I wish students could you know, print off the code and remember to do that process. But a lot of students are also coming in for test taking and then they're looking at, well, I'm stressing out about my test. I gotta take this test. Now I have to learn to remember to take my duo code with me. I've talked with staff at other campuses who have struggled with that because that is another layer onto the process that they're not ready for. We do have some concerns and I've been talking with staff um, about that. And oh, Brandon, okay, I just saw you was Brandon too, yeah. Um, we've been working with him and, and Scott Finkeldine and others to talk about what that's gonna be like. Um, so I do want to shout out, I mentioned at the beginning that it's because of some youth things run well. And we have some great staff here, um, Brandon, Trina, Deborah, uh, things just shifted around on my screen. I can't see everybody's, there we go. Uh, and others who really have helped us kind of enforce accessibility and the need for accessibility. We wouldn't be where we are today with captioning if it wasn't for Brandon and helping us problem solve and thinking through some solutions. Um, with PDF accessibility, we wouldn't be where we are without Trina and Deborah, uh, with online students, with arts and sciences, <clears throat> because we are here to set up accommodations. <clears throat> but the reality is technology and education is shifting around us and we're not tech specialists. Say that with quotes, because I started out my career as an adaptive technology specialist but I'm not going to say I'm up to date on all of that. And we've really had to focus on accommodations and new changes in ways. And we can't keep up in all areas at one time. But we have staff who do. And they're wonderful at it. And so they help us out um, to help support our students. So be happy to answer other questions too.
So Jason, I, I see that you, you know, you work with students a lot. You get that student facing interaction all the time. I'm wondering that the biggest things we do well and, you know, a couple of things that maybe all of us, even if we don't have these specific kind of things, just kind of as an overarching takeaway. Oh, gosh. Um, things we do really well at K-State, um, I would say it's two part. One, yeah, faculty are understanding and they work really well with students to understand their needs and setting up accommodations. Um, I'm going to get deeper into that because that has other pieces with it, but listening to students and really helping to connect with services and, and making that happen has just been exceptional. Um, and a part of that are our students. We have an accommodation for a peer note taker and it's an accommodation like we don't pay our peer note takers. We, um, we don't have a system to support note taking here at K-State yet. So I'm working on that. Um, that other campuses just haven't made it that work. They, they pay students and they have trouble students taking notes um, and different issues come up. Our students who volunteer to take notes in class for another student, it's exceptional. We rarely have students who need a note taker. Students just step up and they say, I wanna to volunteer to take notes for another student. Our students, I, I mean, I think K-State Proud exemplifies this, leadership studies, the work we do. Our students are just there to be helpful as well. And I gotta say, I really like that. Um, and I, I think that students helping students is just exceptional. Not to say I don't wanna do something, I do wanna improve that process, but other students are spending $100,000 a year on these processes that we just don't have right now. Uh, so that's one piece. Now, the other side of that is when we grant accommodations without a student working with our office. And we have uh, a faculty who have said, yeah, I'll, you know, let's, let's, let's work with you on some accommodation pieces in my class, but we don't standardize that by having them work with our office. And it may be situations where I've worked with where the students had accommodations in an area, um, work with some faculty, but we don't actually have the documentation or the information to warrant those accommodations. And it's tricky for the student because they're going to go to another faculty member who can't give those same accommodations. So they don't know what to expect in class to class. That can be tricky. Um, and kind of with that, sometimes I'm guilty of it. I, I, we all, I think, have this, especially last year of a lot of changes is that, oh my gosh, I need to change my class in this way for accommodations. And it's hard to think about. This is going to be a lot of work. This is going to be a lot of um, difficulty. And I think oftentimes many of us kind of go there um, when it may not be that much work after all um, in changing, but it's hard for us to kind of change our flow. I think we get used to that rhythm, the semester, and then we like, oh, I have to think about this as accommodation. And that just kind of takes us out of our pathway a little bit. And it can be difficult, um, but again, we're here to talk. We're here to kind of work through those needs. Um, and I think I'm guilty of it too. You know, I'm like, oh, this is gonna work. This is gonna be great. And then we have this slight change. It's like, ooh, okay, I've got to get out of that path, that change and shift just enough to make me think. Um, but I will say that one of the reasons I like my job is because I like problem solving. Um, and when we work together to think through those problems, it becomes a less of a mountain and more of a, hey, we're gonna learn from this and make things better. And there are times I've had difficult conversations with faculty and staff who just can't wrap their head around accommodation that needs to be in place. And, you know, it's been some difficult conversations, but 99% of the time we come out better colleagues in the end. Jason, I think that's a wonderful thought to end on. We are about out of time. So yeah. please join me in thanking Jason for some wonderful recommendations for how we can teach all of our students in accessible ways. Thank you all. It's good to see so many great friends. So I'll remind everybody that there will be a post-event survey that you can complete, especially if you're working toward the certificate status of the TLC or fellow status. We're going to encourage you to do those. Um, I'll remind you again that this series meets every Wednesday at noon over Zoom. And the same Zoom link that gets you here is going to work next week and the week after, too. Next week, we're going to have Kathy Brockway talk about creative and innovative thinking. And she's going to apply that to the teaching context in particular. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you again, Jason, for being here. And have a great class this week, y'all. Take care. Thank you.